All right. How was lunch? We saved the, uh, the best messages for the last day after lunch because we knew you'd need help staying awake. That's why Pastor Mike is first after lunch. Pastor Mike, it's been a pleasure hearing you, and uh, we look forward to uh, what you've got from the Lord in this session. Well, I just went and had lunch down at the recommended tree hugger restaurant and uh, I enjoyed some nice lettuce and tofu and other things and I was walking out and somebody said excuse me I said yes they said that was a good talk today <laughs> <laughs> true <laughs> crazy if I ask you the question are you a person of faith I wonder what you would say people ask that question you're a person of faith and if you said, yes, I'm a person of faith, if I ask you, well, why would you say that? I wonder what you would say. I would imagine you, like most people, would say, well, I'm a person of faith because I read the Bible. I go to conferences on Saturday in Cleveland. Uh, I stalk Pastor Mike at the tree hugger. Uh, I read my Bible. I evangelize. I have quiet time. I pray. But interestingly, that's not a, what a person of faith is. Are you a person of faith? Why, matter of fact, I am. By the grace of God, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, His death, burial, and resurrection for me. We hear the word faith, and we translate it and conflate it into faithfulness. And faith has an object, and that object is the faithful Jesus, which leads to our faithfulness, that's true. But we are people of faith, primarily, and then that will lead to faithfulness. If you come and visit me on my deathbed, what would be more important, to talk about faith in the object of Jesus or my faithfulness? You probably could come up to me and say, Mike, uh, how's your prayer life here in, in, in the hospital? You know, I noticed the nurses come in and out. Have you been evangelizing them? Or could you say, Mike, are you still trusting in the promises of God? Mike, do you know, God will never leave you nor forsake you. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. Which one would you rather hear? But see, very often we in evangelicalism, we think about faith and we forget that when you see faith in the Bible, most of the time it is faith in the object of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm very concerned because this debate has translated into the sola fide debate, justified by faith alone. Does that mean you're justified by faith in the Lord Jesus as your object of faith, or does that mean you're justified by your own faithfulness? Because one is biblical slash Protestant slash Reformed, and the other one is Romish. So today we're going to talk about justification by faith alone. Sola fide. I just got back from Germany and, you know, everywhere you go, you're thinking about Luther and Calvin and justification by faith alone and how it's attacked these days. And I want to teach the doctrine from Romans 4 and also give you some uh, mental ammunition as you think through the issue. What is the difference between faith and faithfulness and what is, in fact, sola Fide. I think people think sola fide is very dangerous. Justification by faith alone is threatening. Why? Because if you are justified by faith alone, declared righteous by the work of another, then people think that leads to unholy living. It could lead to lawlessness. Paul knew it was a possibility in Romans chapter 5, verse, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the very next chapter, he anticipates a possible scenario. You shouldn't be lawless, but maybe you could be. You might interpret sola fide like that. And he says, what should we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? And how does he respond? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? In evangelicalism, we have justification and sanctification, and they are starting to blend together. 
It's not sola fide, stop, full, start, talk about a new category, sanctification. They're getting blended together. And once you start blending the works of man, my works are your works, into the category of justification, we're no longer talking about the right justification because the only works that can be talked about in the category of justification must be Christ's work. I heard a story once, and I'll put my own spin on it. Uh, 29 years ago, I met this lady named Kim. And uh, I, I wanted to accept her as my wife, but I gave her a cookbook. And uh, I told her that if she could prove herself to be a good cook for 30 years, I might accept her. And that's how people think of Christianity. Not only Catholics, but evangelicals. You prove yourself to do this, 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 and this, and then I will accept you. But what happens with evangelical biblical Christianity? What's the Bible teach? At the very beginning, I accept you. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. I am your father. You are my son based on the perfect work of another, not you. And you stand in my presence blameless. Right? Courtroom language, blameless. And now... You don't have to earn my favor. Christ has already earned it. And now to switch back to the wife illustration, now you're free to cook all you like. You would never accept the theology for me to say to Kim, by the way, you know, I'll accept you if you perform properly, but we do that very thing with God. It's happening all over. Justification by faith alone is dangerous, but on the same hand, it is wonderful to stand not guilty before the God of the universe. Luther said, I have two days in my calendar, today and that day. What's that day? Judgment day. How would you like to stand before God on judgment day and God would say to you, not guilty because of the work of Christ Jesus. It makes your heart joyful. You think, I, I have access to the throne of grace. Rome knew that justification by faith alone was dangerous. The Council of Trent, 1546, said if you teach this doctrine, people are going to go around, they're going to be hellions, they're going to go crazy. You have to control people by, by importing works into standing before God. Council of Trent, Canon 9. If anyone says that by faith alone the impious is justified in such wise as to mean that nothing else is required to cooperate, nothing, in order to obtaining the grace of justification and that it is not in any way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the movement of his own will, let him be what? Anathema. Blending justification and sanctification. Canon 11. If anyone saith that men are justified either by the sole imputation of the justice of Christ or by the sole remission of sins to the exclusion of the grace and the charity that's poured forth in the hearts by the Holy Ghost infusion, let him be anathema. If you let people know they stand before God at the beginning of the relationship as not condemned, moral laxity is going to be everywhere. They love, the Catholics love to cite this Luther quote, and Luther was trying to just point at them and jam his finger in their sternum. Luther said this of justification, No sin can separate us from him, even if we were to kill or to commit adultery thousands of times each day. Now, if somebody committed those things like that, I would say, how could you call yourself a Christian? But Luther's point was this. You are justified by faith in Jesus alone and nothing else. Rome did not like imputed obedience. Why? Because Christ's obedience, credited to our account, would then replace and supplant our obedience. Now, some of you love Richard Baxter, and he wrote a book called The Unreformed Pastor. Excuse me, he wrote the book called Reformed Pastor, but he wasn't very reformed. And he was very Roman Catholic in his view of justification. And what he did is he worked as a chaplain in the New Model Army for Oliver Cromwell, 1599-1658, right around there. And in 1645, he got disturbed. Why? Because the soldiers went around saying, I believe in Jesus, but they lived like hellions. So what do you do? And to combat antinomianism, lawlessness... 
he started writing about justification and added in human works so he could refute antinomianism. First of all, Jesus' perfect life was not credited to our account. There's no double imputation. And he said, basically one's faith, rather than the passive and active obedience of Christ, is the ground for justification. And John Owen didn't like it. And I would hate it if John Owen was going to write a book about me or one of the things that I taught. And I do love the way uh, these old titles uh, were lengthy. Owen responded to Baxter's treatise with this book, The Doctrine of Justification by Faith Through the Imputation of the Righteousness of Christ, Explained, Confirmed, and Vindicated. Baxter said, quote, This therefore importeth that we accordingly submit unto him in those his relations as a necessary means to obtaining the benefits of relations. He is not saying an evidence of my Christianity is I obey. He's saying the means to be right with God is obedience. If you think that's how you stand before God by your own obedience, I ask you a question, how are you doing? How sincere must you be? Can you, can you have any pure work? Is it not true that even our best righteousness is like a filthy what? Rag. And what Baxter is doing is saying, you know what? It's not just faith in Jesus. It's our faithfulness that makes me stand before God. So that old slogan in the Reformation, you're saved by faith alone, but that faith isn't what? Alone. Two separate categories. Justification, a legal standing before God by faith alone in the object of Jesus. Then when it comes to sanctification, but a different category, not standing before God, but as a growth as a Christian, maturation as a Christian, now I, have, well, I will have a faith that's not alone. Baxter was becoming Roman Catholic. I also commend to you an article by Paul Helm, H-E-L-M, that basically shows nine ways N.T. Wright is just like Richard Baxter. But why don't we take our Bibles and turn to Romans, and let's look at the book of Romans before we get into some of the modern writers that do the same thing. And I'll just tell you ahead of time, when I quote these people at the end of the sermon, you're going to be surprised. See how I'm what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to get you to stay awake. Don't fall asleep. I cannot believe I have the afternoon crowd last day after lunch. What did Spurgeon say? Get on fire for God and people will come and watch you burn. <laughs> right? Let's do that. So you turn to the book of Romans, and if I were teaching you at our home church, I'd say there's one book that summarizes all of the book of Romans, and that word is what? One word and only one word summarizes the entire book of Romans. Don't say Jesus. Righteousness. The righteousness from God. You are required to be, when you stand before the righteous holy God, you need a righteousness to stand before Him. And Luther, when he thought about that, he, before he got saved, he knew God was holy and righteous and He was going to be undone. God hated sin. Luther sinned. God hates me. How do I stand before God? His dream was not 401ks and special retirement funds and seeing his children grow up and have children. He thought, I've got, I mean, is there anything more important in this world? I'm going to die one day and stand before God. So he prayed, he confessed. I remember when I was a kid, grew up in the Lutheran church, and I was told if you die with any unconfessed sin um, while you're sleeping or any other time, you're going to go straight to hell. And I remember just laying there at night trying to think of all these things. He didn't understand righteousness that God has could be given to him through faith. And so he tried and tried and tried and tried. He said, years later, reflecting on his experience, I was indeed a pious monk and followed the rules of my order more strictly than I can express. I love this line. If ever a monk could obtain heaven by his monkish works, I should certainly have been entitled to it. Of all this, the friars that have known me, they can testify. If I had continued much longer, I should have carried my self-denials even to death by means of watchings, prayers, readings, and other labors. And he was in despair, and he, he had a man who was smart, and his name was Staupitz. And he said, I've got to stand before God on that horrible judgment day, and God's holy, and I'm not. 
I need a mediator. And Luther started to find a mediator, so he thought, and her name was Mary. We fled from Christ as from the devil and ran to the Virgin Mary and St. Barbara. Often I was horrified at the name of Jesus, Luther said. And when a thought about him on the cross struck me, it was like I'd been struck by lightning. When I heard his name mentioned, I would have rather have heard the name of the devil. For I believe that I must, by my good works, make Christ my gracious friend and thereby reconcile an angry God. And here's what Schaupet said. This is easy for you to remember if you're into history. I told the tour of this in Germany. Staupitz said to Luther, stop it. <laughs> Why do you torture yourself with these thoughts? Staupitz said. Look at the wounds of Christ. Look at the blood of Christ shed for you. It is there the grace of God will appear to you. I cannot, Luther said, and I dare not come to God before I become a better man. I have not yet repented sufficiently. Staupitz said, a better man? Christ came to save not good men, but sinners. Freedom from sin through the blood of Christ. Luther got saved, we know that, and he looked back and he thought, you know what, I am so thankful I don't have to confess my sins for six hours to the priests. Not guilty, based on the work of another, God had him understand. In chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, Paul writes, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faithfulness. Is that what it says? The righteous shall live by faith in another Christ Jesus. God is righteous and he bestows righteousness through faith, taking God at his word. No wonder Luther would later say justification by faith alone is the article by which the church stands. No wonder Calvin called it the main hinge on which religion turns. No wonder Thomas Watson said an error about justification is dangerous like a defect in a fountain. Now there are two ways to be justified in Scripture and we're going to look at chapter 3 and 4 now. This is the main exposition. There's what we call the legal way of justification and the gospel way. One is by works and one is by faith. True or false, God requires perfect obedience to the law. It's true. Take a look at chapter 2, verse 13. These are not theoretical words. These words are true. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but what? The doers of the law who will be justified. Romans 2, 13. People do all kinds of shenanigans with that verse. He's not saying that you can keep the law, but if you could, and if you did, you would earn eternal life. But we know man has fallen in Adam. We know chapter 3, verse 20. Because of the fall, no human being will be justified. But Adam, if he was in the garden and he perfectly obeyed, he would have earned righteousness because you get righteousness through the law. Perfect obedience is the legal method of justification and the one that's the gospel method is the second one. You are justified by faith in the one who kept the law for you. Jesus is sent by the Father to die a propitiatory sacrifice. One rests on our works, we can never do it. The other rests on the work of Christ. We can't add the two, conflate the two, because it insults the work of Christ. I, I remember the one story about the boy swimming in the lake, and he yelled for help, and uh, the young man ran uh, to the water, another man, and, and swam out to rescue this first person. And here's the, how the account goes, quote, In the process of saving the life of the boy who was drowning, the young man lost his life. The two families who had been observing all this were overwhelmed by the unexpected turn of events. The father of the youth who had been saved approached the father of the, dead, uh, the young man, the dead young man, to offer his sympathy. I really can't express how much I appreciate all that your boy did and how sorry I am he lost his life. But I happen to have $1.83 on me. And I want to offer this to you as an indication of my feelings. 
When we try to add our works to Jesus, it, it, it insults the work of Christ, in other words. Justification by faith alone is an irrevocable declaration in the legal courts of God, as it were, that we are declared righteous by the work of another. Not by our good works, but by Christ's good works, and we receive that by faith alone. No other means. Chapter 3, verse 19, as we approach our text. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. So that what? Every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. Paul lays it out. I'm going to keep preaching the law to you until you say... I'm going to be quiet. Uh, yeah, yeah, but what about my good works? What about my baptism? What about this? What about that? And you keep preaching the law until eventually the person's in a corner and says, based on what you've said, if it's true, I have no recourse. I stand before God as condemned. My mouth is shut. Every mouth closed in self-defense. Lloyd-Jones says, you do not become a Christian until your mouth is shut. And you're speechless and have nothing to say. You put up your arguments and produce all your righteousness. Then the law speaks and it all withers to nothing. I deserve to go to hell if what you say is true. Verse 20, by the works of the law, no human being will be justified. Maybe in other people's sight, but not in God's sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Law doesn't save. It was not meant to save. It cannot save. And Paul describes this great justification in chapter 3. But before I go there, look at chapter 4, an illustration of justification by faith alone. Chapter 4, verse 1. And we're going to look at mainly verses 1 through 5 this afternoon. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? Okay, Paul, I can't get saved by the law. You've eliminated that. But you know what? Weren't those people in the Old Testament, weren't they saved by keeping the law? I, I might not be able to. But these Old Testament people like Abraham, he kept the law and therefore he was right in God's eyes. And so Paul's going to address that. And he knew the Jews, especially loved David, loved Abraham. And he's going to talk about those two people right here. And I, and I love what it says in chapter 4, verse 1. What should we say then? Paul goes, I know what you're going to ask, and you're going to bring up Abraham. I know it's coming. Because the rabbis, did you know this? The rabbis taught Abraham was the ultimate man who was justified by works. Book of Jubilees, around B.C. 100, quote, Abraham was perfect in all his deeds with the Lord and well-pleasing in righteousness all the days of his life. The Jews believe, some Jews, listening to these rabbis, that Abraham was perfectly obedient. Here's my only question. I feel like I'm the radio host now. Was that the first time he said in Genesis 12, sleep with Sarah, she's my sister, just don't kill me? Or the second time he said in chapter 20, sleep with Sarah, she's not my wife, she's my sister, just don't kill me. Which particular time are you talking about? The Mishnah said, we find that Abraham, our father, had performed the whole law before it was given. Right? This is before Mosaic law, but he just did it all. But if that's true, what could Abraham do? If he kept the law and was righteous before God because of what he did, what would Abraham do? He'd, he'd fist bump God in heaven. We did it. No, he wouldn't. He said, I did it. I perfectly did it. I got here on my own. I used to worship Nanar, the moon god, or the Chaldees, and now I figured it out on my own. Verse 2 says that exact same thing. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. If he was justified by works, any human works, he could boast before God, but he wasn't. No basis for boasting. Yeah, easy for you to say. What does Scripture say? And here's the citation, verse 3. What does Scripture say? That's a very good question. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Paul brings them back to the specific passage, Genesis 15, verse 6. 
And he talks like scriptures are a person. Personified scripture says what? To back up as a witness. And he even in the Greek throws the word believed up front in the sentence. You know, if you want to highlight something in the English language, you underline it or you put a yellow highlighter on it. Um, in Hebrews, if they wanted to highlight something, they could say six things the Lord hates, yes, even seven, highlighting the seventh one. And if you want to highlight something in Greek, you can do a lot of things, but you can especially throw words up to the front for emphasis. And this word's thrown up there, believed, not worked. His faith didn't earn him salvation. It wasn't the ground. It was just a non-meritorious instrument. He, he took God at his word. And what does the text say? It says, and God did something. It was reckoned to him as righteousness. It was imputed. Nine times, I believe, used in this chapter. Credited. My son is 20, and I've really pleased since the Lord has, well, I've been pleased his whole life, but especially pleased now that the Lord has saved my son. He's studying and learning, and St. Clair Ferguson, John Calvin, da 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 da, da Louis Burkhoff, reading all these things. And, and so he's in Alaska now on a boat fishing and uh, on a barge. And he said, Dad, I was going to come home on August 10th, but if I stay 11 more days, I can make $4,000 more. Could I stay? And I said, that would be good. Because he's got a girlfriend, and he's going to be a senior this year, and he knows the rules in the Abendroth land. There's not a lot of gospel in our land house, but we have rules. The law is this. Don't date until you're ready to get married. And there are other ones. And so he's thinking, what would a ring cost? What about first month's rent, last month's rent, security deposit? It might not, he, she might not be the girl, but he's thinking that. And he thinks, I can make this extra money. Well, he wanted to date this girl, and I said, son, you're going to have to call the father and meet with him. So he called the father, and the father, I think if memory serves, said, that's okay, you can. And, I, and my son said, well, no, my dad really wants me to meet you face to face and ask you, and what would you require and everything. And so they met, and they had a nice cup of coffee. And then the dad said to my son, do you know, Luke, my daughter has about $40,000 of co college debt. What was he saying? If you get married by the doctrine of imputation, <laughs> that $40,000, you didn't earn it, you didn't merit it, but it will be credited to your account. <laughs> that is the doctrine of imputation. Remember Philemon, the book of Philemon, if he has defrauded you and he owes you anything, Paul said, put that to my account. How is Abraham righteous in God's sight? Because God puts righteousness into the spiritual bank account by imputation, and therefore he stands before God. Verse 4, now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. Present tense, the one who works, keeps working, always working. What happens? You get a paycheck. It's not a gift at the end of two weeks. I always think, you know what, if you could get to heaven by good works, it was awful of the Father to send the Son to be crucified on a cross. That's Galatians 2. And now we come to our verse, verse 5, and to the one who does not work, See this whole work, faith? But believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith. And don't just think it's some kind of his own personal faith. Friends, everywhere you go, his faith in God. This is just shorthand for his faith in the Messiah is counted as righteousness. There's a stark difference in contrast between work and faith. And God justifies ungodly people. What's ungodly? Well, here's who God is. He's merciful, gracious, kind, and holy. And everything that God is, we aren't. aren't. We're ungodly. We, we ex live like there's no God. And then God credits righteousness anyway based on the work of another. Don't think of faith apart from an object, Jesus. Don't think justification is because of faith. It's through faith or by faith. The Jews try to get righteousness by doing, and he's saying it's believing. Christ, godly, we are ungodly, God justifies the ungodly. So now here's what I'd like to do. 
Well, I could, and you know what? I just will, for just a quick second, go to chapter 3, because everything stems from this. It says in chapter 3, verse 21, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For all those who believe, there's no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. And the list goes on. Justification by faith alone, if you can remember three components. One, our sins credited to Jesus' sin, uh, account. Excuse me, Jesus' account. Our uh, account receives Christ's righteousness by imputation, and it's confirmed by the resurrection. If you want to think of uh, justification with three components, that's what we would say. So I talked about Baxter. I talked about N.T. Wright. I talked about... Roman Catholicism, and how they're bringing in some of our works into justification. I'm going to give you a quote here, and the person's going to surprise you, uh, but I'll give you the quote first, because here's what's going to happen. You're going to hear the quote and go, I would never believe that. I would never teach that. And I'm going to tell you who did, and then you're going to go, really? And this is, I, I, and I don't put these men into the category of an N.T. Wright, who I think is dangerous to Christianity. I don't put them in the category of Roman Catholicism and say they're apostate like Rome. But I'm just saying for the sake of probably moral laxity and lordship issues and other things, uh, let's put some of our works into the category of justification by faith alone. And they're just sneaking in. So there's a book entitled Faith Alone, and here's what the introduction says. The introduction says the author says the book tackles one of the fundamental questions of our human condition. How can a person be right with God? And so a man is writing a forward to a particular book, and then here's the answer from that man. The stunning Christian answer is sola fide, faith alone. How do you stand right before God? Sola fide. So far, so good? Then this author says, but be sure you hear this carefully and precisely. He, the author, says, write with God by faith alone, not attain heaven by faith alone. Did you hear what I just said? You're right with God by faith alone, but that won't get you to heaven, faith alone. There are other conditions for attain, obtaining heaven, but no others for entering a right relationship to God. In fact, one must already be in a right relationship with God by faith alone in order to meet the other conditions. There are conditions besides faith in Christ to have justification by faith and attain heaven. I hope that rubs you the wrong way. I hope you say, is being declared righteous in God's eyes inadequate to obtain heaven? I hope you say, do I need more than Christ's righteousness to attain heaven? I hope you say, how transformed must my life be before I can stand before God and attain heaven? I hope you say, are we saved by faith alone? I hope you say, I'm not condemned in Christ, uh, not, not condemned anymore because I'm in Christ, but then I need something more? I hope you say, does faith unite us to Christ or does something else? I hope you say something like, once we're justified, we don't need to ask how a man can stay justified or become more justified. I hope you ask all those questions. Because if I just said John Piper said that, you wouldn't believe me. In a book called Faith Alone, written by Thomas Schreiner. Rick Phillips said, to see these works as efficacious with any sense of instrumentality requires us to have two doctrines of justification. One for the present, and if we have enough works, one for the future, in such a way that justification through faith alone is simply not conclusive. This is contrary to Paul's constant emphasis. There is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. If you are justified today by faith alone in Christ, you will be justified when Jesus returns. You'll be justified on that last day. Well, it was the medieval church that began to think righteousness uh, from God is progressive. Good works were a necessary means. If you say works are a means to keep my righteous standing before God, you're in error, you're in Rome. 
If you say, as an outgrowth, as an evidence, as fruit of my standing before God, I will have works, you're fine. Means, conditions must be jettisoned when we talk about our own human works. Evidence and fruit is fine. You have to keep good works away from justification and the instrumentality of faith alone. Luther, works are not taken into consideration when the question respects justification, but true faith will no more fail to produce them than the sun can cease to give life. That is true. They are inseparable, justification and sanctification, but they are distinct. And we should be very, very happy, even when we read Hebrews. What's that chapter 11? What's that about? The hall of what? Are you sure? Because the way we read Hebrews chapter 11, it's the hall of faithfulness. But it's the hall of faith. Doesn't he say in chapter 12, fix your hope and fix your eyes on this Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. We're thinking Noah did something. Noah was just as wicked as everybody else, and he found grace, sovereign grace in the eyes of the Lord. Moses and the rest of those men and women in Hebrews chapter 11, they were all thinking, the Messiah is going to come, and that's who I'm hoping in. They're not in there because they're faithful. Belgic Confession, Article 22. For it must necessarily follow that either all that is required for our salvation is not in Christ, or if all is in Him, then he who has Christ by faith has his salvation entirely. There's a little Confessions app I have on my phone. You should get it. And just for your edification, you should read the Belgic Confession. You might not agree with all of it, but 23 and 24, justification, sanctification, wonderful. The intercessory nature of Christ and how He prays for us, wonderful, devotional. If I ask you the question, how much must you do to warrant your salvation and keep your final justification? You should say that's not the right category. Let me give you another quote. Very, maybe my, fam my, my fa famous, my favorite Romans commentary says this of chapter 8. Turn to Romans chapter 8. Let me read you the verse first. I'm just giving you now um, ways that uh, sanctification is blending into justification, into the wrong category, even with our evangelical friends and brothers. People that write many wonderful things. And if it happens to them, it could easily happen to me or you. Romans chapter 8, verse 12 and 13. Let me read that first because the commentary is on those verses. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Paul is starting off the chapter, chapter 8, verse 1, with no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus and talking about the Spirit of God's work in the life of a believer and how secure it is. And even when you get down to the very end in chapter 8, in all these things, verse 37, we overwhelmingly conquer because nothing can separate us from the love of God. That's not our love to God, verse 39, but God's love for us, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this particular man in Romans commentary says, verses 12 and 13 of Romans 8 cap off this proclamation of life in Christ by reminding us that God's gift of eternal life does not cancel the complementary truth that only by progressing in holiness will that eternal life be attained. Friends, that is categorically false. You don't attain eternal life by your own works. That's papish. How good must your works be? You attain eternal life by the work of another and you trust in Him and you will respond with good works. That's for certain. But the language of attainment and means is not the language of evidence and fruit. Back to chapter 8, verse 1. No condemnation. Never. Not an ounce of it. Not a million years. The opposite of justified. You are not condemned in any way, shape, or form. Past sins, no condemnation. Present sins, no condemnation. Future sins, no condemnation. The first word in the Greek is no. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus as long as your life produces enough good works so you can be assured that God will save you. That's basically how Mu, Doug Mu, has translated it. 
You're either justified by the imputation of Christ's righteousness, a righteousness that you don't have or deserve or is not good enough, or you're justified by Christ's righteousness and your own righteousness. Schreiner, since the Reformation, many Protestant Christians have tended to overstate Paul's doctrine of justification. The consequence has been to exaggerate salvation's already aspects with the effect that Paul's orientation on salvation as not yet realized has virtually collapsed. For Paul, justification remains fundamentally the eschatological day of judgment God will award eternal life to for those who persevere in good works. You are justified and it is complete by Christ's obedience and blood. Yes, but if I talk about these categories, faith in Jesus alone, people are going to go wild. But your job is to preach the cross and Christ Jesus and trust in Him and it is God's responsibility, not your job, to deal with things afterwards. I'm not going to slip in works to just try to control people. Maybe my favorite quote of all in Everlasting Righteousness, which you can read online for free by Horatius Bonar. These expressions of the apostle have often been shrunk from, dreaded as dangerous, quoted with a guarding clause, or rather cited as seldom as possible, under the secret feelings that unless greatly diluted or properly qualified, they better not be cited at all. But why are these bold utterances there if they're perilous, if they're not meant to be fearlessly proclaimed now as were written 1800, 18 centuries ago? What did the Holy Spirit mean by the promulgation of such unguarded statements as some seem disposed to reckon them? Then I love it. It was not for nothing they were so boldly spoken. Tim and words would not have served the purpose. The glorious gospel needed statements such as these to distangle the great question of acceptance, to relieve troubled consciences and purge them from dead works, yet at the same time to give works their pop proper place. Schreiner said, those who are children are also heirs, but this inheritance is also conditioned upon obedience. If what I'm saying is right, you're justified by Christ's work alone, justification. That cannot be true. Your inheritance is conditioned on your obedience. Friends, how are you doing? How have you prayed today? Have you evangelized today? Have you loved God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength today? Could any of your works meet the work standards of God? Schreiner said, too many Protestants reduce faith to a mere verbal agreement. Many are mistakenly assured they'll enjoy eternal life apart from any obedience if they accept Jesus as Lord. You say, well, you're just being picky. Yeah, I, I am being picky because you can't say means and conditions and attainment for eternal life through faith plus works. It's called Rome. How am I doing? Am I doing enough? Am I faithful enough? How can I stand before God? No wonder the evangelical church in America has hardly any assurance at all. If this is the kind of stuff we get, what's the sin of presumption? It's the Roman Catholic doctrine that says you can't be assumed and assured you're going to go to heaven unless you're Mary or you're Paul or there's another special way to go. The Reformation came and said, listen... The Catholics are trying to take your assurance. Let us give you your assurance because if you trust in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. Are you trusting? And you're like, yeah, but what about, what about lordship and repentance and this and that and forsaking? Okay, I'm there because if God does save you, there will be a change. As my old buddy used to say in South Central Los Angeles, if there ain't no change, there ain't no change. If there's no change in status... Then there's going to be no change in works. And if you say, well, I have a change in status, but there's no works that come along as an evidence of, well, there's no change in status. I mean, Daryl Hart calls this not easy believism. He calls it easy obeyism. How much do you have to obey? 
Now, the, now the reformers knew it's faith alone, and they had categories for faith. There's, there's an intellectual knowledge, there's a, an assent, I agree to that, and then there's a holy trust. And you can look up the Latin words if you want, and notitia, and ascensus, and fiducia. I like just knowledge, assent, and trust. It's the only cat I like, K-A-T. Knowledge, assent, and trust. They weren't trying to produce hellions, but they weren't going to say, you're standing before God based on your work and Christ's work. Spurgeon, as soon as a repenting sinner is justified, remember, he is justified. He stands a man, all, here stands a man all guilty. The moment he believes in Christ, his pardon at once he receives, and his sins are no longer his. They're cast into the depths of the sea. They're laid on the shoulders of Christ, and they're gone. Now, I like this part right here. They were laid upon the shoulders of Christ. They're gone. A man stands guiltless in the sight of God, accepted in the beloved. What, you say? Do you mean that literally? Spurgeon, yes, I do. That is the doctrine of justification by faith. We give people assurance who are trusting in Jesus. Oh, yes, he's living with his girlfriend. I don't give him assurance. But if the person is trusting in Christ Jesus, if somebody says to me, I, I don't know if I'm saved or not, I begin to tell them about Jesus, and are you trusting in that Jesus? John Owen knew, and to say that no man is completely justified in the sight of God in this life, is at once to overthrow all that is taught in scriptures concerning justification. We're justified by faith alone in Christ's work, and now to keep my justification, I need evangelical obedience? You say, well, you're, you're, you're lawless. You, you're an antinomian. No, we just have a category for how you stand right with God. Because sin has so tainted every aspect of our lives. Matter of fact, when you think of the word total depravity, what do you think about? Well, you know, people aren't as bad as they could be. Hitler was even nice to his dog. Well, I guess before he killed him, he was nice, but then at the end he killed him. Total depravity is this. Whole depravity. W-H-O-L-E. Mind, soul, will, emotions. All depraved, affected by the fall. Can something like that, dead in trespass and sins, alienated, blind, contribute anything? No, it has to be all of God. And if you are justified, what should your response be? Belgic Confession 24. Far from making people cold toward living in a pious and holy way, this justifying faith, quite to the contrary, so works within them that apart from it, they will never do a thing out of love for God. It is impossible for this holy faith to be unfruitful in a human being. Justification by faith alone must not lead to sin. It should not lead to sin. It leads to a motivation for holiness. I stand before God accepted. I don't have to cook for 30 years and say, by the way, now can I be accepted? You say to yourself, my sins, though many, they've been forgiven. Because as Jesus said about that lady, she loved much, and he who has forgiven little loves little. I wonder if you preach the gospel. Do you preach sovereign grace in such a way where people say, by the way, if I do believe that, then I could just keep on sinning right afterwards because I'm standing right with God? Lloyd-Jones says, if people don't ask that question, you haven't preached sovereign grace. This is a very good test of gospel preaching, the doctor said. If my preaching and presentation of the gospel of salvation does not expose it to that understanding or misunderstanding, then it's not the gospel. Let me show you what I mean. If a man preaches justification by works, no one would ever raise the question. No one would then say, shall we continue in sin that grace might abound? If you do preach works, no one would say to you, oh, by the way, can I just keep on doing things? There should be no fear for preaching justification by faith alone. We know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. And we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is true God and eternal life. Our obedience is tainted by sin. It is an imperfect obedience. 
Furthermore, even our faith in Jesus, the Messiah, is tainted by some unbelief and fear and presumption. And then Paul goes on in chapter 4, verse 6. We don't have time. He uses David as an illustration as well. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. It's a parallel passage. It's, a, it's another example. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. You say, well, you seem to be making a big deal about this. The church loves to go back to Rome. I'll give you another illustration of how we do it. Every one of us would say, you know what? It's the scriptures plus tradition plus the magisterium. Rome doesn't believe in sola scriptura. They believe in prima scriptura. Scriptures at the top, then secondarily tradition, then down here magisterium. And we say as Protestants, we would never do that. We, we believe in sola scriptura. Well, you know what? Christians every day do the exact same thing. They don't believe in sola scriptura. They believe in their scriptures, in their intuition, in their feelings, and they are functional papists by believing in prima scriptura because they're so mystical. This is the default position, going back to Rome, because it goes back to human works. Unless you think that somehow your faith saves, I want you to be reminded that faith did not live a perfect life. Faith was not virgin born. Faith didn't die on a cross. Faith is a gift from God, and it means you're trusting in the work of another. Faith wasn't raised from the dead. And the great news, friends, is even a feeble faith, a weak faith, a, 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 a handicapped faith, trusting in the real Jesus, stands uncondemned before that Jesus. You can just imagine, okay, it's Passover, and uh, Daddy, you're going to have that little lamb. We've had that lamb live in the house for the last year, little fluffy, and now you've taught me that the wage of sin is death. Either God's going to kill us or he's going to kill that lamb, so I'm going to kill that lamb. Okay, everybody, let's have a good illustration. Put your hands on the lamb, and Daddy's going to slit the throat of that lamb. Well, how hard do I push? What happens if I don't put my hands in the right place? And if that dad was thinking rightly, he would say, none of that matters, kids. What matters is we're trusting in what God says. And God says, if you slay the lamb, you will be rescued. The focus is not how great our faith is. It's the object of our faith. Faith is in our Savior. You can have an imperfect faith, as one writer says, and connect you to the perfection of another as a sin bearer. This also should help people who think, I'm too sinful to come to the Lord. I'm too filthy to be cleansed. I can't do enough. And I would be remiss if I said not these words. Are you trusting in Jesus Christ and His life and death alone? Are you trusting in your baptism too? Your good works, your catechism, your confirmation? The only way to stand before God is on His terms. And his terms are, I have to see you through the lens of Christ's perfect work and his death for your sins and his resurrection. That's the only way God can see you. And this means if you're a Jew or a Gentile, you, you can still look to that very Savior. I was in South Africa, and I got a phone call, and the phone call was uh, Mike Mark at church, 52-year-old married man, no children. Oh, yes, he did have children, excuse me. is dying of cancer, and he might not make it. And so I called Mark and said, I'm here in South Africa teaching, and I won't be able to make it. I love you. Can I pray for you? And um, we had a good conversation. I make it back to Boston. I go visit Mark. He's still alive. I walked into the room, his wife slipped out. I walked in the room and I went over and I put my hand on his shoulder and I said, Mark, this is Pastor Mike. And I wanted to say that I love you and I'm back from South Africa. You could just tell he, he, he didn't open his eyes, he didn't, he didn't do anything except like I recognize that. And I said, Mark, uh, you're ready to die because you're going to die. And he opened up his eyes. And I said, Mark, you're going to stand before God. Are you afraid? And he said, no. 
And then I don't know why I said this, but I said, Mark, shouldn't you be afraid? You're standing before God. He sees everything. He knows everything. You're certainly sinful. I was trying to promote a response, and I got the right response. With kind of a jerking moment, he said, No, no, I am trusting in Jesus, my sin bearer, and I'm not afraid to go to heaven. I just started crying. Weak faith? Cancer-filled faith? What about my wife-filled faith? But faith in the right object. My hope is built on nothing less than my evangelical obedience. I met a guy, he said, I had a heart attack. I was laying there in the church. I started thinking of songs. And I, I didn't think of shine, Jesus, shine. He said, I thought of my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus, but in righteousness. That's how you stand acceptable in God's eyes. And the natural, real response will be sanctification and works, but don't confuse the two. Okay, that's how you maybe keep people up for the post-lunch talk. Thank you very much. Let me pray. Father, we stand before you as condemned sinners until it pleased you to justify us, to do that work, and you granted us faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior. Thank you to be forgiven. I'm afraid to go to court and stand before a judge or get deposed for a human court. And yet here the guilt, the, the, the guilt is imputed to your son and not to us. Thank you. And I pray for anyone who is here today trusting in evangelical obedience for their right standing before God that you would help them understand that is not the case. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's take uh, five, ten minutes.